Okay, let's get started. It's 7 p.m. in Singapore on Wednesday, 29 July. And on behalf of the Singh Health Duke and US Global Health Institute, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this webinar. This is our fifth and final webinar in this series that looks at the impact of COVID-19 on health and health inequities in the ASEAN region. Today, we'll be looking at how COVID-19 has impacted non-communicable diseases in the ASEAN region. Topics to be covered include management of specific NCDs, health systems adaptations, and the role of the private and public sectors in areas like screening, health education, and management. We'll also be looking at the needs of vulnerable populations and how to incorporate the, their specific concerns. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Carolyn Lamb. Dr. Lamb is a senior consultant at the National Heart Center in Singapore. She's globally recognized for expertise in and focuses on causes of heart failure. She's a recipient of numerous research awards, including being the senior investigator for the Asian Network for Translational Research and Cardiovascular Trials. And she's a principal investigator of the Asian Heart Failure Study, which is a multinational study across 11 Asian countries. She's widely published, and I won't list her many publications, but they're easy enough to find. You may have also caught her weekly podcast circulation on the run, and if you haven't, do try to follow it. It has some really interesting episodes. She is a resident doctor of Body and Soul, uh, which is aired by Mediacorp Singapore. Um, and before I hand over to her, I'll just say a few housekeeping notes. The webinar, as you might know, is being recorded. You can post your questions and answers in the question and answer box at any time during the presentations, and they'll probably be addressed towards it, more towards the panel at the end of it. Um, so with that, I'm really excited to hear what our speakers have to say today, and uh, I think there's, there's a lot of material to cover. So Karen, over to you. Thank you so much, Amina. And first of all, thanks to you and your team for organizing these amazing webinars. So it's really my big pleasure to introduce this fantastic faculty that we have here. May I please start with the ladies? And so Ms. Deborah Glidia. Hi, Deborah. Now, she joined Novartis Social Business in May 2017. In her role, Deborah oversees commercial operations and expansion of Novartis Social Business in the entire APEC region. Last year, Novartis Social Business's health education programs under her leadership reached more than 9.6 million people across Asia. Now, Deborah graduated, uh, all our faculty are so, so just, uh, so qualified here. Listen to this. So graduated with an MA in physics from Oxford University with a Sloan Masters in Business with Distinction from London Business School. And really her illustrious career, I can't summarize, it's taken her all over the world. She in fact relocated to Phnom Penh in 2013 before moving to Singapore in 2016. And she comes with really rich insights into emerging markets, developing countries in Asia. So welcome, Deborah. So pleased that you're joining us. And then, if I may move next to Dr. Faisal, it's one Mustafa. Hi, Faisal. Now, Dr. Faisal is a public health physician and currently the deputy director at the Disease Control Division, Ministry of Health in Malaysia. His special areas of interest are diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. At the Ministry of Health in Malaysia, his main roles include policy and program development, and strategic implementation of interventions for the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. Now, in addition, Dr. Faisal has special interest in leveraging on technology in catalyzing behavioral modification to reduce the exposure to non-communicable disease risk factors. And I think we'll hear a lot more about this. What I love most is what he, he volunteered later or I found out. Dr. Faisal's goal in life is is to complete all six world marathon majors and so far he has done tokyo and berlin whoa that is that is awesome all right <laughs> indeed applause and and next if i may please introduce professor bonsworsum ak lirapan and and, we, and he's kindly said that we can call him ak here so professor ak is currently assistant professor in the community medicine department at Ramathi Body 
Medical School of Mahidol University in Bangkok, Thailand. He is a preventive medicine specialist with research interests in health organization studies. His direct observation of inequitable access to quality of health services while he was managing and implementing very key Thai directives as both a doctor and a hospital director were well, what inspired him to pursue a postgraduate study in health policy and management. I really like that personal anecdote. At now, since 2012, his work at Mahiro University has been focused on health system strengthening. And besides teaching and research, he is also deputy director of the Center for Health Policy at Faculty of Medicine, Ramathi Bodhi Hospital, and also serves as a member of national level committees, including the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Prince Mahiro Award Foundation under the Royal Patronage. Welcome, Ak. And of course, last but not least, Professor Jack Tan, a dear friend, someone I've always admired for years and years. <laughs> and I'm going to embarrass because I'm going to gush about him because he is doubly accredited for both cardiology and intensive care medicine in Singapore. None of us do that. He does that. He is deputy head of cardiology and director of the coronary care unit at National Heart Center in Singapore. He's head of cardiology at Sengkang General Hospital. He is a practicing interventional cardiologist and holds adjunct assistant professor positions at Duke National University, uh, National University of Singapore and a lecturer appointment at Yonglu Lin School of Medicine. If, as if that's not enough, he has got an executive MBA. He's a frequent proctor of interventional cardiology in countries like China, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines. He's an executive board member at the Singapore Heart Foundation and the Asia Pacific Society of Interventional Cardiology and wait for it, he's president elect of the International Society of Cardiovascular Pharmacotherapy, as well as the standing president of the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology. And you can imagine someone who wears so many hats has to be in many places at the same time. And even now, Jack just told us he is actually virtually in three places at the same time. <laughs> so maybe Jack. <laughs> Let's let's maybe start you off before you have to virtually go to to another meeting, and and really um, we're discussing non-communicable diseases today. Let me just frame it because we could go very very broad, but we want to go deep, and um, maybe just starting with cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, something I think we all touch on, and so Jack, with COVID nineteen, on the one hand. We know that people with chronic cardiovascular diseases are, seem to be at greater risk of having COVID-19 and having severe disease. On the other hand, you've been having all these webinars all over Asia PAC that have clearly discussed that there are no more acute admissions for acute heart attack and heart failure. Like, where has everyone gone and yet they're at risk of COVID? So could you maybe describe the acute or short-term impact uh, that COVID has had on cardiovascular disease? Thanks, Carolyn. Um, well, your introduction is, as usual, very amazing. And um, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I just want to quickly share maybe one slide to uh, set the stage uh, for the audience uh, in what we're talking about. So I, I think my observation, again, my disclaimer is that unlike the other professors there, I'm not public health. I'm just a practitioner on the ground. A lot of my information comes from the network of cardiologists across the region, observation, and maybe some of the articles I've read and discussed with uh, the key opinion leaders. I think for today's topic, I just want to just focus on this, what I found was a very good public health slide. I think uh, in relation to time and where our health footprint is at this stage in the pandemic is six months on. I think we'll pass probably the immediate uh, aftermath of mortality and mobility of COVID-19 where healthcare resources are swamped and all this and uh, really the patient uh, non-communicable care takes a back seat. So what I've observed is that uh, in countries where we went through, I personally went through SARS as a registrar uh, whether it's in Thailand, Malaysia, Korea, or China, they're actually probably better prepared when it came to the acute phase because they were pretty much uh, affected by SARS. Um, then you have the second wave where the resources were impacted uh, based on restriction on 
urgent uh, non-COVID condition. So we're scrambling to say we switch from acute PCI to door to needle time or thrombolysis for STEMI care. And uh, the third wave they put on this chart is interruption of uh, care, what I call the collateral damage of chronic conditions, whether it's diabetes, cardiovascular care, cancer, COPD, there are innumerable chronic conditions that we probably are neglecting while we focus all attention onto COVID-19. And of course, we shouldn't ignore the fact that uh, we are probably at the stage of going to the fourth wave of a lot of mental stress, the economic as well as the mental burnt out that most countries are experiencing as this drags on. So what is same and what is different? I think after going through SARS, it was more scary because we were more unprepared, but there was no onslaught of webinars galore every night. There was no <laughs> onslaught of WhatsApp, text, and too much information in my mind. So there was a lot of mental stress going on as we accumulate this time zone of mental stress. SARS went and came within approximately six months, eight months, but I don't see the light at the end of the road for COVID-19 as yet. So although the chart shows that the third wave, the in interruption of chronic care is a small bump, in my mind it's not a small bump, it's becoming a bigger and bigger bump. But this interruption of care for diabetes doesn't just interrupt the chronic care that we're delivering, but impacts on the fact that we're less able to do screening. Uh, NGOs uh, and uh, companies that do screening in less developed countries also have to withdraw all these uh, services. Mm. Education is restricted. The exit exam I'm planning for my cardiologist have been pushed back indefinitely. Uh, the European exam they are writing was initially planned to do, be done in June, now it's postponed to November because exam facilities are not open. So it's, it's multiple rounds here that we're talking about in terms of interruption of care, both for patient, progression of doctors, training, education. And um, I, I think this will hit us a lot more, just maybe in the year the, uh, or the year after. And Caroline leads a lot of research projects. I'm sure it's frustrating for Caroline to have to delay some of this very meaningful research as well that's going on. So I think it's a big third wave impacting and merging with the fourth wave of stresses. So um, with that, I think um, we'll ask the rest of the public health uh, physicians to share their thoughts as well. And of course, yeah. I'm happy to address the other uh, uh, questions about clinical care impact. Thank you, Caroline. Oh, it's a great point, Jack. And and if I could then quickly ask Faisal, because um, you know you you provided these beautiful slides, and and just I, I really want to pick up on the point that Jack mentioned. That is this going to emphasize the inequities in the healthcare system? That's very very scary. Uh, what are your thoughts here about how the health system has had to adapt in the short and long term? Right. Um, thank you very much, um, Karani. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, so what Jack has done is taken one of my slides, actually. <laughs> ah, like this guy. Terrible, are you? Anyway, um, I'll share my set of slam. I'll share, um, I think, just to, 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 to set the scene, as it were, yeah. and to ensure that... It was um, a great slide, I, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, um, but you know, you should attribute it to somebody. I'm not saying it's mine, but I'm just saying, um, you know. Anyway, um, so before we, we discuss this further, I think it's very important for us to see where we were uh, pre-COVID-19. Um, not just the readiness or the way the healthcare system was delivering care, but also the health-seeking behavior, as it were, of the population, um, which will be different in different countries across um, Asia. So you have your patients or your population, the way they engage the healthcare system, the healthcare system itself. And the other consideration is the way we can collect the data, the surveillance, as it were, NCD surveillance. Uh, because as what um, Jack have rightly pointed out, we are concerned, I mean, people with NC, working with NCDs are concerned about the collateral damage. But if you look at the collateral damages in terms of mental health or the other related issues, these are not easy to capture uh, if you were to monitor this um, over time. We are worried, 
um, but it's not easy to capture. So that's the pre-COVID-19. Um, as Jack has rightly pointed out, and I agree with him, we are past that enforcement of movement restrictions. A lot of countries in Asia, in the ASEAN region, is already moving um, past that. Um, when we look at the post-COVID-19, um, we need to talk about the immediate, uh, me uh, medium term and long term, and perhaps we can discuss that later. And collateral damage have been touched briefly by Jack. Um, in terms of, uh, um, sorry, when we talk about the NCDs, a lot of discussions has always been around this, the disruption here diagnosis and management. I, um, I, I do admit that um, Jack did touch upon the um, prevention bit. Uh, one thing that people forget is, for example, if you talk about NCD, is the HPV vaccination, for example, um, which is run in some countries like in Malaysia as a school-based program. Since school is closed, so that got disrupted. So um, the vaccination of certain NCDs that can be prevented, um, your health media campaigns uh, totally been taken over by COVID-19, although we can actually leverage on the, um, you know, the, the extra burden that NCD patients experience due to COVID-19. Um, the screening in the community, community-based interventions, and people um, not talk so much about rehabilitation and palliative care. Uh, when WHO did their survey uh, among all countries, and I think about 186 countries responded to that survey, the most disrupted is actually on rehab and palliative care uh, in terms of services. Uh, but yet, um, in a lot of webinars, um, a lot of it is focused on you know, the diagnosis and management. So I think um, we are also, you know, um, heard a lot about this, so perhaps that's something um, that we need to look at. Because as a service itself, um, at least in Malaysia, um, palliative care is still um, not as developed as it should be, um, given that we are an aging um, population. Um, so, so going back, um, these are all the as were the areas that we could explore further, talk further. Um, but I'll stop there first. Um, back to you, Karen. Ah, that's that's a really really good framework to consider um, the whole continuum of the NCD care. Uh, you know the disruption of palliative care and rehab. It's going to have a huge impact on secondary prevention, isn't it? Um, I'm I'm actually bracing myself to see it. I actually wonder, um, Ak, if, if you know while we're on the topic of the health systems, um, has has attention been paid to that in Thailand as well? And are there any other perspectives that you may be able to offer on this? Sure, topic? sure. Uh, well, thanks, Carolyn. And good evening from rainy Bangkok. It's so <laughs> rainy here. Uh, just just be talking. Um, uh, one message I would like to add to Jack and Faisal. Uh, you know, confusing. That's Jack and M. Ak. It's Jack without the J, by the way. <laughs> um, the, the COVID-19 itself disrupt NCD care, sure. But uh, we, sh we should think about it. It's also the policy to control COVID-19 that actually disrupt NCD care even more, right? So it's not disease itself, but how we try to cope with our COVID-19. You know, and because everyone is concerned about it, so concerned about it, sometimes we just ignore it. Um, I would add that uh, when Jack talking about the, the fourth wave of mental health, it's not actually uh, people who suffer from COVID-19 or family and relatives of those victims, but also people who actually suffer uh, economically, socially, from their social distancing, from their shutdown policy that try to, uh, try to control COVID-19 as well. So maybe I have one, uh, one slide to, to share about that. Um, it's come from our work, try to do uh, system modeling on COVID-19 epidemic and also uh, the policy to control COVID-19. Sorry, oh. this is in Thai. Uh, it's, 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 it's not for, for this discussion, but let's say um, when we try to control the susceptible to be exposed uh, and then infectious, we do physical distancing, we do hand hygiene, wearing masks, that's fine. But when we try to decrease the community uh, density, like shut down workplace, school, uh, and control our uh, socialization, that impact a lot of people. And maybe a part of it is uh, create mental health issues, a part of it create uh, economics suffering, like people lose jobs, right? That's also 
if you ask me, a part of health impact as well, even it's called mental health. Um, another one is when you try to do the quarantine testing or uh, isolation, that's kind of public health uh, intervention. You have to think about some uh, of the population that Faisal is talking about. People in uh, uh, nursing home who require long-term care, palliative care, actually are at risk if you, if you don't do that that well. In fact, NCD in those uh, uh, facilities are uh, the highest risk when people dying in Northern Italy and also in the UK, right? Because they couldn't, uh, the, the term they use is cocoon or their nursing home that well. So a lot of elderly with our high risk of uh, mortality from N NCD actually dying. Of course, in ASEAN, in our uh, Oriental culture, we do it differently. Maybe we, 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 we live with our elderly in the community, right? We don't send them to nurse, nursing home. But even so, there's still some issue that we have to think about how to quarantine, how to isolate these people from, you know, the risk that actually going to be with us for a long run. And lastly, uh, everyone knows that uh, NCD are one of the risk factor of high mortality rate if you get COVID-19. So if you want to save people, uh, not not right now. Maybe it has to be that it has to be done long time ago is actually prevent uh, people to, from getting risk factor of NCD since the beginning. And that's what actually Faisal was talking about. Prevention is, is much more important this day, but as people say, uh, the best day to plan a tree actually uh, 20 years ago, right? Uh, but the, the second best day actually today, maybe we have to think more about it. So uh, just to add that if we want to control the epidemic, even just the COVID-19 itself, we have to do a lot of things that impact our NCD patients. And then if you think about how COVID-19 impact health system, that's another question. You have to adapt and, and try to live with, you know, for example, uh, accessing to the healthcare facility without much congestion. Maybe hospital care is, you know, be becoming less and less important compared to other uh, mode of healthcare accessibility, including using digital health. Uh, that's for now, I guess. Over to you, Helen. Yeah, so so thanks. You brought up a lot of important points, and I really want to bring Deborah in soon, but just, just to revisit a couple of, of important things. You know, uh, you, you talked about in Asia, our, our elderly stay with us. I have to tell you that on a personal level, that was very, very trying. Um, they, they may stay with us or they may stay at home, uh, on, on their own. But when, when they do, they also suffer isolation because in Singapore, for example, during a, a very severe uh, period that we called the, the circuit breaker, we were not supposed to at all even go visit elderly uh, um, grandparents and so on. So this sort of um, a collateral damage of isolation, uh, I think is, is a big deal. And, and Faisal, you, you had mentioned that. Um, could I could I ask you on a personal level? Let's just take it personally for a little while, because you are the um, athlete here, right? Uh, uh, we're, we're talking about NCDs, which means healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, and things like that are so important as part of prevention, uh, both primary and secondary. How ha have you personally struggled to keep that up during this period? Like you're running and and. Right. You know, and, and you know, we hear all these stories about people who put on, what is it now, 15 kilograms is the average weight gain or something like that during the lockdown. Did, did I read that? I mean, I mean anyway, I, you know, I, some press somewhere I thought, oh, is it 15 pounds? Anyway, you know, but it, it's scary, right? Thinking about what we may face later, Jack's laughing at me, but you know, Faisal, I mean, any... Right. Um, so um, my two immediate thoughts um, to your questions. Um, Firstly, um, I'm a self-confessed nerd. I've been a nerd all my life. I'm still a nerd now. I've Yay. only started my running journey in 2016. Um, so I've never been an athlete, um, nothing like that. Um, the furthest I've run was five kilometers was when I was in secondary school. So um, if and now somebody you run told me, uh, yeah, now I can do full marathons. You know, if somebody told me in 2015, Faisal, you can run 42 kilometers, I said, go fly kite. You know, what are you talking <laughs> about? Um, but now, so my first point uh, nothing's impossible if you put your mind to it. Um, that's why I, I like to talk about my, that part of my journey. Um, motiv the motivation to change your behavior, um, that's something intrinsic. 
um, and that's a topic by itself. Um, however, it is all about prioritization, um, you know, how much you prioritize. And prioritization is not just about knowledge and awareness. Um, it's, it's a bit more, um, more than that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, but I think more importantly, in terms of um, the impact of the uh, movement restrictions is on self-care, if I may use the word. It's not me, you know, who are motivated to be active. I mean, I'll find some ways. And actually, I was running around the house, um, you know, like 70, 80 rounds. Um, I'm lucky I'm, oh, I live wow. in a landed, landed property. So I'm, I'm lucky um, I have a landed property. Uh, but yeah, um, but um, it, it's not fun. Um, it's not fun running around. Um, I will find a way. But for somebody um, who has NCDs or who have NCD risk factors, it becomes more challenging. Uh, we did a, a survey and we found that, um, that, well, I can't retrieve the exact data, but we found that people were eating more fast foods. Uh, mm -hmm. People were eating, uh, drinking more sugar-sweetened beverages. Yeah. Um, of course, they were more sedentary. I mean, that's a given. Uh, but people were eating more uh, and sleeping more. <laughs> Um, so these are not good behaviors in terms of self-care per se, especially if you have um, NCDs. And if you um, take into account um, the mental health state, being stressed, depressed. And I've heard this said, and this is not my words, we are all facing the same storm, but we are in different ships, right? We, we, are, you know, we, we, we are in different situations. So for, you know, for some people, it hardly impacted them. For some people, it does. Um, however, when it comes to vulnerable populations, uh, which was your earlier question, it is the vulnerable population, for example, the older adults, uh, the lower socioeconomic class, not only are they more at risk for NCDs in the first place, they are at high risk of COVID-19, secondly, and because of those, they are more at risk of higher consequences of COVID-19. Yeah. And they are, you know, they, they basically, they, they are dealt with very bad cuts. Um, and, um, and I think, um, and not I think, sorry. And that what motivates me to advocate for the focus um, to be more on vulnerable population. Like I said, we are all facing the same storm, but we are in different ships. Um, different ship. So um, we must ensure that the interventions and, you know, if my just me just advance in a, an, another stage, if we talk about digital health interventions. Mm -hmm. um, my concern with digital health interventions is not only the users um, are, are at the lower risk, um, you know, so the, it doesn't benefit the, um, the at most risk because they are less likely to engage. But by virtue of this acceleration of digital health solutions may in fact uh, make that gap um, between widen it. Widen it. Um, so yeah. sorry, I'm taking too much time. I'll stop. No, no, it's it's a really, really good point. And and Deborah, I mean, we've we've these are such important issues. We've been talking about it all. Actually, all of us are from the public health uh, 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 side. Could you share some perspectives from your work? You know, from us. Yes. So, so we work in those very vulnerable populations in rural communities um, across many countries. And uh, I agree with everything that's been said. So we focus on the prevention. So we do our health education is all about trying to educate people about the risk factors, because we know that this is actually the most cost effective intervention that can be done from the WHO uh, seven best buys, and also on early detection. But all of those, the way in which we do this typically is to gather together groups of people in a community setting, which of course has been, at now we have to look at different ways to do this. So, because what we don't want to do is to change the risk benefit um, for, for the very communities that we, we want to work in. So if I think about Vietnam, where we typically work with about 1900 primary healthcare centers uh, in rural communities uh, in both the North and the Mekong area, we've had to delay that work this year. Um, we hope we are just beginning to start now. 
Um, but the, I agree with what Jack has said, is that actually that there will be a third wave for NCD, and it may be a number of years before we truly see the impact of our inability to, to reach these people, to educate them, to detect them early, so people will present later. Some of the data we've seen in the previous webinars, we know that uh, logistically it's been difficult to ensure that PPE has been available in primary healthcare centres. And also, again, because some of the connectivity issues that have just been touched on by Faisal, people have been reluctant to go to those primary healthcare centres because they've been worried about, will I meet somebody there who has COVID? Will I catch something? So they've been delaying trips to go and see the doctor. So I think, I think what we're seeing at the moment is a small fraction, sadly, of, of the impact in these vulnerable communities. And we need to find smart ways of reaching them. So uh, in India, for example, we're now doing door-to-door -to -door, door -door work. But inevitably, that means that our reach will be far less this year than it was last year because it's it takes longer to reach the same number of people so it's very challenging wow that that is so real but i'm i'm just really glad that you're thinking about this in a large scale and empowered to do that from the industry standpoint jack could i bring you in here because you've been um industry tends to partner with with cardiac societies which i think is very important um, because we, we, we see this tsunami with the collateral damage coming up, if I may, you know, borrow words from everyone. Um, can, can you maybe describe what the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology may have been doing or has done to sort of address this issue? How, how are we going to brace ourselves for this upcoming, you know, wave? So actually, none of us actually as clinician actually have thought about how do we brace ourselves for public health. We're just probably surviving day to day, trying to cope and treat with the patients that we have on hand. Maybe I can share some perspective here. Uh, if you talk about Asia Pacific, and my member countries are 22 of them, stretches from UAE, Mongolia to South Australasia, is very disparate, including Vietnam, Thailand. And there are countries like Myanmar where they don't even have the COVID-19 PCR diagnostic kits available. So you, you think about their workflow and going around to triage patients is, is a nightmare. Uh, versus country with low versus high rates, uh, more developed or more wealthy countries like UAE, having even a, a, a negative pressure uh, care flag, for example, unlike all the other centers with all positive, care, positive pressure care flag treating COVID-19 patients. So, I think we don't have a solution for all countries, and therefore it's also not uniform. What APSC could possibly adjust is sharing of information, trying to get the point across that we still need to advocate for the COVID-19 uh, collateral damage, so to speak. Uh, collaborative information on gathering what is this disappearing ACS-like uh, population, and how do we tr best treat this group of patients in terms of best practices when they do come for ACS or STEMI. So the conclusion just briefly is that we shouldn't change too much from guideline practices based on the best evidence when we treat acute cardiac conditions. I think we shouldn't say because it's COVID suspect and compromise care. So that's one thing you have to take note of. Second thing, I really like what ACT has said so far. For countries that have done their homework prior, I think it's easier to address when the problem does come. So for example, uh, in December, my boss actually, I won't name him, complained that Singapore wasted so much money building a 300 patient bed uh, hospital, NCID, to tackle an empty hospital, might as well pay me bonus. So that was open in September last year, and yeah, 16 years me, after me. SARS. And we had COVID-19 in February. Yeah. So I think it was that preparedness that really helped me able to address and treat them based on the best practice and guidelines in my country at least. Um, but I think it's not true throughout all countries. I, I also like to say that uh, the societies and professional bodies have uh, ownership to also lobby for public health measures. For example, you talk about vulnerable groups. 
I, I really like what uh, Faisal has said. When COVID-19 hit communal living places like the dorm workers, because they were living community in Singapore, yeah. I was actually more concerned because they were next to a nursing home, also near the hospital that I was. But I think seeing what happened to the dorm workers, I think Singapore reacted very fast to address this cohort and it never blew up in the uh, nursing home, for example, which would have high mortality rates. Jack, Jack, you had first-hand experience there because not everyone might know what we talk about when we say dorm, dorm, because we, we, we're so used to it. Oh, okay. so describe that. Describe what the living condition, the, you know, what it was like. Yeah. So firstly, uh, uh, we have a 5.8 million population in Singapore. A lot of people probably don't know that any one time, 47% of the people in Singapore are foreigners. And uh, 1.4 million people in Singapore are actually workers or transitory workers, out of which 300,000 of them are living in dedicated dormitories that we purposely built for this uh, foreign worker cohort. So we call it dormitory workers, dormitory uh, living quarters, communal living. So when COVID-19 went into the dormitory in communal areas, it was really a big uh, 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 spread among the dormitory workers. Um, the, the part about vulnerable groups I was getting back to is as society and professional bodies, I think we can lobby a little bit more in terms of the policy addressing this group. For example, I, I think you talk about healthy living and we, we, are, is, we are very generic in our policy. We say that maybe you lost your job. I give you a food voucher. You go to the supermarket. What, what do the vulnerable group buy? They buy mask bars, snack bars and all this. I think we need to be a bit more refined about when I say I give you a food voucher, you can only buy healthy food, green type, and not unhealthy food. So I think we can lobby for that. Don't forget about smoking cessation and all the other things that I think we continuously need to work on for professional societies. I think that part has not been addressed. I think in the midst of all this COVID-19, people are forgetting that there's still a huge vulnerable population, not just those that have current NCD, but those uh, have not been diagnosed with NCD and mental stresses. Thanks. Beautifully put. And, and frankly, this is exactly why we're having this webinar and, and I'm learning a lot um, um, just by listening to. And act, I mean, you're, you're a preventive uh, specialist. So um, how, how, to, how to now, you know, in the current new normal, how do we institute these preventive measures a bit better? Act, sorry. <laughs> you're, you're All right. forgot to unmute. No. Uh, it's not an easy uh, question to answer, but everyone has to try to think uh, uh, when, when we have this you know, huge crisis, it's also a big opportunity to change uh, things that's usually difficult to change earlier, right? Um, Deborah, are you from uh, the UK, right? So let me borrow your uh, late Prime Minister, um, Winston Churchill, <laughs> who actually said, uh, don't let the acute crisis go to waste. And this is it, right? Um, if people think about preventive measure is maybe not necessarily for some group of population that may not uh, be concerned at all, they are healthy, right? Um, or they, uh, we ignore a lot of people uh, that may not be in as much as inclusive in our universal health coverage. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, let me tell you this, Jack, when Singaporean are uh, second wave uh, happened with the migrants worker. Um, people in Thailand are also concerned about migrant worker in Thailand, you know, people from Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos. Um, we are also talking or uh, working with people in our Ministry of Public Health. In fact, uh, we went to see community of living uh, of those migrant worker. But I, I would say this, it's also Thai uh, community that live like migrant workers people who come from rural areas living in Bangkok, for example, in big city. So it's not uh, for a certain group of population who are at risk. You have to think about our uh, risk factor or characteristic of our uh, people or behavior of people that are at risk of NCD. Now, COVID-19 basically, Carolyn, reveal everything, right? No, yeah, nobody yeah. is hidden from this crisis. Yeah. So you can think about elderly, you can think about uh, people with uh, underlying disease, NCD or COPD uh, who are at risk. Uh, maybe they just are uh, being ignored before because maybe they're smoking, they, uh, there's still some people who think about them as people who harm themselves uh, without considering the structural intervention that we might lack of to prevent them to get uh, to that uh, risk factor since the beginning. 
now we are in it together. Uh, and if we don't do anything, we're going to suffer a lot uh, from those uh, risk factors. Uh, so that's one thing I can, I can talk about. And then let me show you this picture um, from Thailand. Oh, sorry, for, forgot how to share this first. Again, sorry. And this is basically NCD care in Thailand. Uh, it's hospital care. And it's not a, a festival, it's every day in, in our patient clinic in, <laughs> in any public hospital in Thailand. And most NCD patients got uh, their care this way, a very short period of time per visit and not very well coordinated between healthcare team members. So now people start asking questions why we have to do it this way. People bypass primary care, people bypass ambulatory care to go to hospital because they think they could receive a good care from specialists perhaps, or with much better uh, equipment in the hospital. But right now people learn that, well, when COVID-19 happened, we won't go to the hospital and why after that we will go to the hospital. We need to we think about how to deliver healthcare to the people and people start to think, how should they receive that care uh, in, a, in a different way than previously before. Obviously, this one part of your question. And then uh, after people think about different means of receiving and uh, providing care, uh, I think more and more people are going to ask more what actually uh, effective, what actually uh, more convenient, what actually uh, more efficient, right? So um, that's, that's one thing that I learned from this crisis, that people actually start to ask questions that they never asked before. Yes. Um, so maybe um, we try to think about the positive thing uh, out of this crisis, but also it's a chance to do something uh, together right here. Um, we actually one of the first group in, in, in research community in Thailand that tried to, to ask the, the grant funding to start asking about what to do with non-COVID patients. Because in the first month, we only concerned about our COVID patients. Uh, yeah. Just like myself and Jack uh, grab about third wave, uh, fourth wave. We're gonna live with this for maybe a year or so, you know, until vaccinations cover for everyone, right, to the herd immunity level. Until that, we have to learn how to live together um, with a new way of healthcare delivery. So um, I'm not sure I ask, uh, I'm answering your question, but uh, it's oh, just it's starting the movement of how to think about the, the old thing in different way, I would say. Yeah, I, 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 I love that thought and I, and that, picture was what really said, you know, a thousand words there. Um, and, and I totally agree with your point that it has forced us to become open to many things that we would normally shut our minds to before. For example, even this webinar is, is an example of things that we just thought was not, we wouldn't do it, right? Um, and, and so Faisal, I've heard so many times that technology may be the answer. And yet you've rightly pointed out that technology may also be the knife that will divide even more. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just thinking of the fact that in clinics now, I mean, my hospital system is forced to do virtual clinics. Tell me that last year that we would do that, I'd say, no way. We're so risk averse. I, I don't know what they're afraid of in the air or in the web or whatever it is that, that we will never ever do that ever, ever, ever. And now it's, it's, it's actually systematized. Um, and then I thought, oh, you know what? This is going to benefit some, the young tech savvy and so on, not the others. Not true, not true. My, my auntie and uncle uh, all have smartphones and they were perfectly able to communicate with me uh, uh, through that as a clinic visit, a virtual clinic visit. So, you know, um, could you expand a bit on, on that, that thought is, is tech, the answer to how we're going to get through this? Okay, um, I would agree with the observation that there is some positive side of the COVID-19, especially um, adoption of digital health solutions, if I use the broad term. Um, it, it has accelerated, um, you know, um, because you're forced to. Um, so I think that's that we could all agree. Um, and all the other 
I would say even this webinar, you know, this um, increasing our capacity of healthcare providers, um, you know, coming up with projects, uh, new initiatives virtually without meeting face to face. I've completed two projects. That's I can't even imagine that happening um, prior to COVID nineteen. You needed that face to face, um, you know. So um, that's um, very positive. Um, um, there is also a question um, that from. Um, Key, uh, from Yong Kin, I'm, I'm going to answer live here. Um, we have data um, that shows. Okay, let's uh, let's talk in context. So it's easier for Malaysia. Um, we have data to show from 2019 that the health literacy of Malaysians overall adults is quite low. On um, one third have low health literacy. But what's more interesting, uh, which we don't have data, is the level of IT literacy. Yes. Um, smartphone penetration in Malaysia is also high, but what kind of smartphone is usually used not for health, for social reasons. Um, it's usually the lower end, lower memory. Um, you know, they have limited data plans and they would reserve their data plans for social purposes, not for health. Just to emphasize another point, uh, we did, um, I use the word quick and dirty survey, which is ongoing. Um, which I like to be able to publish. Um, we ask our type 2 diabetes patients who are seeking treatment in MOH health clinics. Um, and these are in urban areas. So their median age is um, around 55 to 60 years, which corresponds to the data in our registry. So that's the age of type 2 diabetes patients in MOH health clinics. And 80% of people with diagnosed diabetes seek treatment in MOH facilities. So basically, that's almost all. And you know what? When we ask the question, what's your preferred medium source of information with regards to your diabetes, 50% says television. You know, I, I hardly watch television unless you count Netflix as television. You know, 50%. Um, 60% um, still like face-to-face with the healthcare provider. And in Malaysia's context, it's still the doctor that they prefer to see, not the nurse. No matter how well we train the nurse, they still prefer the doctor, unfortunately. So we talk about task shifting. We have not been successful in task shifting. It's a perception of the public. And um, WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups, 50%. WhatsApp groups is very big in Malaysia. You know, My dad has God knows how many WhatsApp groups, um, 50%. And when we ask specifically, if are you interested to use apps, 2%. Okay, so that's the reality. Um, I would perceive it differently because I'm from the atas, higher socioeconomic class, and my group of friends are all the, the same. So I think it's very, we need to, you know, be aware. Um, there are many solutions out there now, and it has been accelerated by COVID-19, but I'm very concerned it is not benefiting those um, who are having. And the question is how we can we do that? Um, I don't have an answer. I think we need to discuss around that really, rather than talk about all these nice solutions about you know online triaging, virtual consultation. Okay, I'll stop. Um, Ek must to say something. I, actually, Deborah, I think could I get Deborah? Yeah. So, so um, we've we've done a lot of experiment with technology, um, and actually, the technology can do a lot of things for us and we found surprisingly that even patient, people in very rural communities are actually much more comfortable with a, a distanced uh, consultation than we thought. The biggest oh. challenge is cost. So at the moment it is more expensive to offer a digital solution than it is a traditional face-to-face -face. and we, we need to find a, a way to solve this to make it more affordable. The um, another challenge that we face is often the regulations are still based around a paper based system. So in many countries, you cannot get a prescription filled without a physical prescription. So and some countries have adapted to this already through COVID, but we need to move more quickly. The one area that we are finding very cost effective is actually to use technology to train um, primary healthcare workers so, so and community-based people to improve the quality of care, which of course helps with the pictures that, that ACT was showing, which we see in so many countries where people bypass their primary healthcare centre 
in the mistaken belief that they will get better care in a city. So uh, technology can solve some things, but for us to really solve the inequities for some of these communities, cost is the cost and regulation, I think, are the two barriers that we need to find solutions to. Great points. Ed? Yes, uh, let me add, add on briefly on Faisal's and Deborah's point. Um, my argument is our uh, digital solution is working uh, effectively uh, and we cannot um, sort of avoid thinking about it. But it's not a digital solution alone. Uh, we, it's going to be fail, right? We have to equip digital solution with a redesigned healthcare delivery. That's my message. So um, uh, in short, you have to integrate digital health solution in the way you design the care process with healthcare team, with different group of population, uh, with NCD, with high risk, with people who have uh, a risk to become NCD and people who are actually healthy and try to prevent their NCD. They have to use digital solution and use their healthcare team differently. In the past, we might not be able to do that, but with digital solution, uh, there's a way to do so. Let me share you three, uh, three ideas that might be able to cope with this. So this is, uh, I show you guys uh, the, the hospital in Thailand, right? And this is primary care in Thailand compared to that in Singapore. Uh, the left is Singapore, the right bottom is uh, Thailand. Maybe, I don't know, maybe the physicality of it, the, the um, people bypass it for some reason. A lot of people still using it, but not much in urban setting. So when we become more urbanized, that's the issue. Now, uh, you know, Chris, Creighton Christensen, our Harvard Business School professor who just passed away this last year, I think, uh, actually coined the term disruptive technology. He thinks something is considered inferior in the past could become an extent for the future. Um, you know, you think about full, line, ally, full, uh, full service ally versus low cost ally or things like you know, CD versus MP3, things like that. But think about healthcare, it's just like Faisal said. Maybe primary care is disrupt our big UC hospital because it's not appropriate for NCD, but eventually self-care. Self-care is going to be replaced, or, you know, not, not only just doctor, but also nurse practitioner, nurses, and other healthcare team because now the role is going to be changed. Our NCD people are going to be in charge of their health. And then our team of healthcare providers actually going to be facilitator or coach to help them getting better. And using it that way, I think we can customize digital technology that appropriate to the group of people. Of course, we can use, use them to coordinate care between healthcare team, that's integrated care by definition, right? Mm -hmm. The last idea I would say that we have to map the journey of different group of people. We have different risks of NCD. And these different groups gonna use our healthcare differently, or utilize healthcare team differently, and then, um, Looking from this perspective, we might be able to use digital health for vulnerable population by targeting some people. In fact, I would say this, Faisal, when we know they are so high risk, uh, we have to go to, to their home rather than depends on the digital technology. Mm -hmm. But without uh, classify people in different groups, we're going to use digital technology for everyone or we're going to bring them if, uh, everyone to the hospital or the clinic. Uh, either way, it's not working. So maybe a hybrid or, or a managed way to do so or to integrate digital technology with redesign healthcare services could be a way to go. Over to you, Karen. Great point. So it's not one size fits all. There's pros and cons. I, I see Amina maybe indicating to me, um, um, have I lost track of time or are there questions that we can, we can address? Amina, you're muted. Hi, there was a question, uh, in fact, um, maybe back to ACK uh, or anyone else where someone asked the question, has there been an attempt to study, uh, or to study, to do a community network as special, specific media might not be available to many individuals, you know, uh, so is there kind of a community network model that you've studied or know of? Mm. Interesting. You mean com community quarantine, right? Uh, no, I think the question is uh, that, you know, when, when each one person can't access a device or a smartphone technology, then have you done it at the community level? Um, I'm not sure um, I remember it right, but there's some study in some both developed and developing countries. 
in developing countries like uh, Japan, for example, they use a lot of community health center for a lot of different uh, uh, health care activities. Maybe also sort of supporting system uh, socialization of people who are uh, at, at the same sort of uh, sharing some experience together, like the elderly. elderly. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of thing can be provided at community health center, um, maybe provided by financed by local government, something like that. Um, also in developing countries, they use a lot of community health center uh, in different way. Um, but I, I never come up to, to um, can, can ever think of our intervention specifically designed to use digital health uh, for the group rather than for the individual. Okay. Maybe start with family. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. By the way, there's, there's a lot of uh, intervention in the past decade talking about e-health, mobile health that use volunteer go to the community. But maybe that's not uh, the way people who ask this question frame the question. Right. And I, I will kind of uh, throw in something maybe from a totally different discipline. If you look at what's happened in the financial sector, you know, you see a lot of examples of uh, technology being used at the individual level with very kind of uh, simple apps and simple ways that, you know, people have got all kinds of groups, you know, even groups that you might think don't have the expertise or the, the, no, uh, the financial means to do this, but actually they have been able to adapt. Uh, and adopt to these uh, new kind of financial um, apps and other ways of accessing the banking sector, which was totally out of their uh, purview. So, so that's an interesting, um, you know, cross-discipline thing to think about. How can the health sector look at some of that uh, technology and do it at a more simple level? Yeah, and I think you, I mean, I just, you just emphasized on the part I made earlier that it has to be integration between people and technology. Uh, so even financing, uh, it could be complicated for some people, right? You have to have, have some sort of uh, advisor to help people use the technology. We in healthcare, we know that it's even more complex than that. So maybe that's the way to go. Not just uh, either or, but we have to combine and redesign them together. Um, I mean, I see there's one question here that's quite juicy. I, I, can, I, can I see if we can go for it in the remaining time and maybe have um, Faisal and Deborah just be ready to give short answers, okay? So it's from Michael Yu. Since the pandemic, there's a significant decline in the prioritization of primary care in the Philippines, just like the other countries. Along with this, essential health examinations are also being deferred or um, it, uh, uh, because of community quarantine. Some health exams require face-to-face -face sessions. Um, when, what do you think are possible alternatives to these face-to-face -face physical exams, auscultations and the likes, knowing that most NCDs are slow and silent killers and are commonly neglected when a health worker isn't able to intervene? So, so short answer, uh, foof. You know what experts do, right? They make simple things complicated. Um, right. Um, <laughs> so um, two immediate points um, I, uh, that I could think of. Firstly, I've seen technology already that enables this to be done remotely. You know, even auscultation to be done remotely, if that was the thinking. And blood tests that can be done. Okay, let's not talk about, you know, how accurate or cost effectiveness, but there are technology. So I think that's my first point. But my second point, uh, which is uh, very relevant for us in Malaysia, is the um, earlier point I said about the health-seeking behavior. Um, Malaysia, the data shows that a lot of Malaysians are not doing their health screening, medical checkup, even the simple ones, like blood pressure, blood sugar, blood cholesterol, you know, simple ones. And when we did a study, not we, um, a group of researchers in one of the universities did a study the main like cause of the cause is because these individuals rate health as low priority. Um, mm -hmm. And this goes back to the point Amina made. Perhaps why they are more engaged with the banking kind of apps is because, you know, money, money, you know, money is always high on everybody's priority. So mm -hmm. you felt it is important, but whereas health, so I, 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 I do apologize. Then how do you raise priority? I do not know how you raise priority, but we need to be aware that awareness and knowledge about health doesn't raise priority straight away. Um, so uh, 
again, I do apologize. I'm not offering solutions, but I'm just saying that um, these are the things that if somebody out there, the listeners can think of how you raise health in terms of priority, then perhaps that will be the question that needs to be answered rather than the technology per se. Okay. Thank you. And Deborah? So um, just to, uh, to build on what Faisal has just said, I think sometimes it's fear that, that actually prevents people from going and seeking. And, and I sit and listen to a lot of people who say sometimes that they would rather not know. And the sad thing is that if, if only they'd had the courage to go sooner, perhaps there was a different outcome that would have happened for them and their families. I think so technology, there's some really good apps, some free apps actually now that are available that can act as screeners and really hopefully prompt people to go and ask those uncomfortable questions that sometimes they're too scared to do. So, and, and I've tried some of them out and actually their accuracy is, is pretty good. So I think if we can work with governments, get these supported, uh, encourage them, these might be some of the ways that we can also start to encourage more of that health seeking behavior as alternatives to the face to face methods that we currently use. Great, Deborah, for the 5% who will use apps according to Faisal. But Jack, Jack, I know you've got one thing we can just. Uh... <laughs> uh, so I, I just wanted to Sorry, echo some of the points and give you my perspective as a clinician. So, so I think all the points are very valid. But I want to just bring a more optimistic pitch to this. I think for those countries that actually may not have so much resource and everything, I think it's an opportunity for everyone to consider leapfrogging countries that have over-resourced in the old model of care. If you have built billion dollar hospitals, lots of public facility, you tend to want to go back to them and use it, right? Because they've funded them. I think there's an opportunity for everyone, especially those underprivileged, underdeveloped countries, it, well, it's the internet of things now. I think it's, it's your desire and your resources to make it happen. I think there is a chance to leapfrog. And my view about leapfrogging is that the healthcare system currently is the mode of the doctor can see you now. It's, it's catered to the doctor's time. But I think what should be delivered should be on demand for what the patient needs. I think the facing of how it needs to change for leapfrogging needs to be orientated to what the patients need. The other thing I want to emphasize is that we also, as a professional body, need to advocate that during this period when there's so much intention and everything else, that we shouldn't neglect funding ongoing projects and research in NCD care. I want to make a pitch for cardiovascular care, not cancer care. <laughs> They're already overfunded, so uh, please. And new methods of care. I think a lot of NGOs and uh, industry like Novartis has done great work. I saw their project in Vietnam and everywhere. It's effective is on the ground, they focus on screening, prevention, rehab. So these are the things that classically hospital care, neglect, do poorly. So we, we need to learn from each other to do this much better. And we shouldn't neglect that a little bit of funding in this area goes a long way in cardiovascular care. And we still need to continuously fund people like Carolyn in their endeavor to drive uh, research across Asia Pacific. So I, I think- uh, right there, fund Carolyn. <laughs> uh, fund Carolyn, yes. Fun, my professor, Caroline. Yes. <laughs> Thank you uh, so, so much. So this I'm message sorry. is for Deborah from Novartis. But anyway, <laughs> I just aside, I think I think you just want to give an optimistic pitch. I think COVID-19 is not going to be here forever. But I can promise you, NCD, cardiovascular disease, is going to be with us forever. So I think we shouldn't neglect that. We shouldn't be too pessimistic about what's happening. It's just give us an opportunity to rethink our model of care to be more effective, to be more outcome-based, to be more patient fronting and for us to advocate a lot more as uh, practitioners. So I think there is a silver lining to this. We just need to be a bit more resourceful and uh, more persevering um, in our efforts, I think. So um, Carolyn. That's perfect. Over to you, Amina. <laughs> well, I think we are all out of time. So I know. It, it, it would be nice to keep talking about these things, but I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to do that again. So I would just like to end with saying a big, big thank you to our moderator, Carolyn, to all our panelists. It was a really interesting discussion. 
And I really do look forward to kind of trying to engage, you know, uh, in a practical way, Jack, as you just said, there are many practical things we can take away from this. So let's see how we can go beyond just the discussion and the dialogue and engage and not only with the panelists, but even with the audience, please feel free to reach out to us and, you know, uh, talk to us about any of the issues you want to follow up in a practical sense, as well as, you know, uh, more discussions. Um, we will continue to have uh, webinars in, on different topics now that we've kind of engaged in this format. <laughs> so uh, please look out for the, them and thank you all really for your time uh, and uh, your attention to these issues. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.